and I want to come back to, to Darwin, certainly, when we move on to, to talk about now your most recent book, which, as I said, is, is uh, 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 written. Well, you, you tell us, what age is it, is, it, is it written for? Is it written for, for children, young, young adults? I would say young adults. I mean, maybe a median age of about 15, but um, I'd like to think that uh, it goes down to about 10, uh, certainly bright 10 year olds and goes up to about 102, which was the age my mother was when she died and enjoyed it very much. <laughs> okay. The main mission it feels like is, is to ensure that children and, and the people who read it uh, dismiss any belief they might have in God. And I think that if that's a fascination of the book. That's... Well, let me stop you there. It's, it's, I, I rather wish they'd I prefer to say, think for themselves. I mean, I, 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 I'm anxious but because I've so often been critical of uh, religious interests um, brainwashing children. I'm very anxious not to do that. And so constantly throughout the book, I, I've said, think for yourself. And what do you think about this? What's your idea about this? So I'd, I'd, I'd rather not say quite that it, the, the, the aim is to turn them into atheists. I, I, I'd rather want them to, to think for themselves. I think if they do think for themselves, they will probably become atheists, but that's another matter. Well, it, so they, they encourage your right to think for themselves. It's, it's, it, it, every chapter ends with a question and, and, every, and every chapter is a question, but it's quite clear from reading it and obviously from knowing previous thoughts of yours that, you know, you, you go to, to, to great lengths in, in here to prove or to show that God does not exist. And I, I'm wondering why that is so, so important to you. Well, mainly because I care about truth. And it, it's as a scientist that I care about truth. Um, there are other reasons, of course, which is that religion can have very bad effects, especially if, if children are so fully indoctrinated that they go to the lengths of wanting to be martyrs for the faith or something like that. Um, but mostly I care about truth as a scientist and somewhat unlike many scientists when they consider this question, I actually think that the existence or non-existence of a god or gods is a scientific question. Um, I don't think it's a matter of personal taste. I think that there is, it's a scientific question in the sense that a universe that is created by a conscious intelligence, a god in other words, a universe that's created by a god would be a totally different kind of universe from a universe that was not created by a god. So this is not a sort of incidental thing where you can sort of take your pick, well, it, it feels right for me. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I, I like the feel of that. I like to feel that probably is a god. It's good, it's, it's good for me to feel that. No, it, it, it's either true or it's not. It's one of those questions that is either true or not. Now that doesn't mean we can tell whether it's true or not. That doesn't mean that the methods of science are at least yet able to decide whether there's a god, but it is nevertheless a scientific question. And so as a scientist, I care about whether it's true. And I think the evidence, certainly there's no good evidence for the existence of a God. I think that one can say there's rather good evidence against. So you, you say that sort of it can indoctrinate children and have bad effects, but uh, obviously a, a vast amount of religion is something that actually brings sort of security and, and comfort to many people. And especially now we're all going through this uh, extraordinary time. You see that, um, religion coming together as religious communities can can give people, as I say, a great deal of comfort. And I wonder whether why you would want to sort of take that uh, away from them, essentially. Well, I don't want to take it away in a sort of wanton way. I don't. I'm. I, I'm I don't have a sadistic pleasure in taking away comfort, but I, I just think that truth is more important. Um, I suppose doctors face this when they, they have a patient who has terminal cancer and they have to decide whether to tell the patient that they've got six months to live, whatever it might be, or whether to simply lie to the patient. And you could say, well, don't be such a horrible doctor. Don't tell, don't tell this, the, the, the patient. But many patients actually want to know. And I think that as a very good case for saying that a good doctor will find ways to tell the patient uh, that she or he has got cancer. Um, so it's not an obvious thing to say that because somebody gets comfort from something, therefore you shouldn't disabuse them. 
I think it's a moot point anyway, whether people really do get comfort for it. Maybe some people do. But um, when you think that many children are told in childhood when they're at a very impressionable age, that if they're bad, they're going to go to hell. They're going to roast forever in hell. Uh, in extreme forms, this doctrine says that when their skin has been peeled off by the fire, they'll grow another skin so it could be peeled off again. I mean, this is terrifying stuff to those people who believe it. And many children do believe it. And so if you go to your, if you are approaching your end and you believe that hell is a reality, I'm not I'm sure that that's right to call that comfort. Um, I mean, I've actually known people who are old and who are pro approaching their, their, their end who are literally terrified of going to hell. Um, and so it, it, it's not an obvious thing that, that religion does give comfort, even if you don't think you're going to hell, if you think you're going to heaven. The idea of spending not just a, a few, a couple more centuries, but literally billions and billions of centuries um, doing nothing very much in heaven is a pretty unpleasant prospect to, to some of us. Um, so it is not obvious that, that people get comfort from religion. I suspect people are more likely to get comfort from other things like the warmth of human love. I wonder too whether people really believe, uh, whether many religious people actually do believe that they're going to survive their own death. I think if they did, when somebody is told by a doctor that they have terminal cancer, they should say something like, oh good, I'm looking forward to this. Um, this will be rather fun. I'll be able to see my grandparents and so on. They don't say that. Um, and when you're talking to a person who is near death, you don't say, uh, well, do give my love to Uncle Robert when you see him. Uh, we, we, it's as though people don't really believe it, as though they just pretend to believe it. But it, I think going back to the meaning of life, don't you don't you concur that for many people, the idea of there being more to life than just this one, to go on to another place, does help people in this life, and perhaps in many ways, it, it makes life in this life feel fuller and more and more worth living if they for people in this life. I doubt that. Uh, I fear it has the opposite effect. That if you if you think that you're going to another life, you don't take this life seriously enough. I mean, I think the one of the most wonderful things about not believing in an afterlife is that it makes you really, really de decide to make the most of this life, not just for yourself but for other people as well. I think there's something rather corrosive about believing that this life is only a sort of rehearsal for the eternity that's to come in, an, in another life. Uh, so I think I'd rather dissent from your suggestion there. I, what you go on to talk about in the book when you're talking about this is the idea of a morality being imposed upon people by, by, by religion and that we shouldn't assume that we wouldn't be moral beings if we didn't have religious codes. So for example, the idea that we need to be good in this life to make sure that we get to the, to the next. Where do you think then that the idea of good or bad, you know, what is right and wrong, kind, unkind, where does that come from if it's not from being passed on to us through religious code? Well, it can be passed on not through religious codes. It can be passed on through moral philosophic codes. I mean, we have secular philosophers, moral philosophers, who, who reason about what is right and what is wrong. Um, the golden rule, th things like that. I mean, be, do, do unto others as you would wish them to do unto you, that kind of thing. Um, would you wish to live in a society where people steal and rape and murder? No, you wouldn't. I mean, so, you know, you, why not try to live this kind of life that you hope other people would uh, surround you by? So moral philosophy, um, it, which, is, which is secular, or at least mostly secular, can be secular, is where we approximately get it from. Ultimately, I suppose we get it from our evolutionary past. There, there are good biological reasons for being good, um, to, certainly to kin, and that kind of generalizes to society at large. But I want to come back to the idea that uh, re that religion is a good way to get our morality. I think it's a terrible way to get our morality, really. Um, you mentioned the idea of, you didn't put it like this, but sucking up to God. Um, <laughs> it's not a very noble motive for being good or being afraid of God, being afraid of going to hell, wanting to go to heaven. These are 
a sort of apple polishing motives for being good, which I don't think I really want to respect somebody who's only good because they're sucking up to God. And even more so somebody who, I was once talking to a, uh, uh, a man in Texas, I think, on, on the, I was on the radio and he was one of these phone-in things, he was phoning in, and he phoned in and said, if I didn't believe in God, I'd go out and murder my neighbor. Well, the re reaction to that is, well, I don't really wish to know you. I mean, if, if that's your only reason for not, for not murdering your, your neighbor, you're not, you're not the kind of person I would want, wish to, to, to be anywhere near. And I think most of us would agree with that. We're of not. Course, but that, that, that's so. That's quite an ex extreme example. But what, but it the, is, what it's about, yeah. And the, what you talk about in the book is the great, what you call the great surveillance surveillance camera in the sky, and yeah. our conscience is just knowing that someone is watching. And and you say you'd like to believe that humans are better than that, and you'd be honest whether yeah. watching or not. So I agree with you. But the experiment you cite in the book shows that unfortunately yeah. that isn't the way. Yes, I know. Describe that. I know it's very upsetting, isn't it? Um, the experiment you're talking about is by Melissa Bateson, <clears throat> and she, um, uh, in, in her scientific department, um, she provided coffee uh, for people to help themselves. <clears throat> but they were supposed to put money in, an, money in an honesty box, and so she had a measure the amount of money that went into the honesty box. She had a measure of people's honesty, and she every week she put up a price list. And at the top of the price list, she drew either a pair of eyes, she's a, good, she's a good artist, either a pair of eyes or flowers. The flowers were a control. And when she drew a pair of eyes, during the week after she drew the pair of eyes, she noticed that the amount of money put in the honesty box was more, significantly more, which suggests that the, the members of her department were influenced in a subconscious way by the, um, thought that they were being watched. Well, that's, <laughs> I mean, obviously they didn't really think they were being watched because they knew it was only a drawing of eyes, but it suggests that there's something innate in us, which suggests that being watched, uh, having, a, having a conscience is, is a matter of whether we're being watched. Well, if that's true, then as you say, the, the great surveillance camera in the sky, God watching everything you do and even reading your thoughts um, is a, uh, Unfortunately, it, it, it might be a realistic m motive, but it's still not a very noble one. It's a rather ignoble one. Um, the other way in which people sometimes say that religion contributes to morality is through the Bible. And I think if anybody who's actually read the Bible would disagree with that, um, if you actually read the Bible and you imagine getting your morality from the Bible, with one or two noble exceptions like the Sermon on the Mount, Almost every other verse in the Bible that mentions morality, mentions any kind of moral lesson at all, is appalling, especially the Old Testament, but also the New Testament. So do not get your morals by reading the Bible, whatever else you do, that will, or indeed the Quran, um, that would be a terrible way to get your, your morality. Get your morality by, I almost say, intelligent design. Uh, get your morality from moral philosophy from thinking it through, from thinking what is the kind of society in which I would wish to live? What is the kind of society in which I would like to be treated by other people? Therefore, I should treat them in that way. <clears throat> the very basic tenets of, 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 of a good society, love thy neighbor. I know there are, there are lots of other commandments that you wouldn't advocate, but they have filtered down from religion, ultimately. Well, love thy neighbor is something that Jesus said, and various other teachers have said it as well, including moral philosophers. It's a fairly obvious maxim. And who would, I mean, who, who would dissent from the idea that, that we'll all lead a happier life if we love our neighbor, or at least be charitable to our neighbor, at least, I mean, give money to charity, give, give um, be, be, a, be a nice person. Um, why would we not wish to, to live in a society of that of that sort? You don't need Jesus to tell you that. Can, can I come back to another point that comes through? In your book, you, you talk about, you, you reference a lot the US. Um, and I've heard you do lots of other, you know, in, in lots of other interviews similarly, where there are, uh, there is a much more sort of fervent fanatical side to, to, to religion. And I'm wondering, you don't necessarily distinguish so much between the, f the fact that there are a lot of people very sort of quietly, peacefully practicing 
religion. Is that not fine? Yes, it is. And, and I think that the, the um, you, you've rightly discerned a tendency to concentrate on America. And that's because so much of the American public, as we know from polls, take religion very seriously in a fundamentalist way. So, I mean, some huge number of, of I think it's near, nearly 50% of the American public um, believe literally in the book of Genesis, for example. And so it was finding it fairly natural for me to think of my audience as a largely American audience, because they're the people I wanted to reach. I mean, they're the people who really need, need to be converted, so to speak. Um, but yes, it's, it, it, it's important to stress that there are perfectly decent religious people who are nothing like that uh, in America, in Britain, all over the world. I don't why do you think America does have that? Why, why does America, <laughs> is it singled out in that way, particularly as, as a sort of first world country? Yes, I mean, it's, it stands out like a sore thumb. If you actually um, look, look at a graph of, of, of um, educational level, economic level and so on against religiosity, um, the, tendency, the, the, the tendency is for the higher the educational level of a country and the greater the economic prosperity of a country and the welfare pro pro provision of a country, the lower the religiosity. America stands out as a sore thumb. It, 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 is one of the, it is the most economically prosperous country in the world and it has a very high educational standard and yet um, it is one of the more, most religious countries, certainly in the Western world. It's a very odd phenomenon. I don't really understand it. There have been various suggestions made. Um, one, is, one interesting suggestion is that because the Constitution of the United States uh, proscribes religion. There is, there is, the constitution says there shall be complete separation between church and state. Um, and that means that religion has been free to become free enterprise. And so big business, I mean, televangelists vie with each other for custom. They, they buy television and advertising time they, and they become immensely rich. So free enterprise conspiring with religion uh, has, has made religion popular in America. That's one theory. If you look at countries like Scandinavian countries and Britain, where there is an established church, religion has become boring. And it's become just, I mean, ch church is a place you go to, to be married and buried. Um, and, and, and it's not a place you go every Sunday out of conviction. Um, whereas in, in America, people do. And when you move into a new town, people invite you to to a party and, they, and the first question is, they, one's often told, which church do you go to? Um, and, and it's assumed that you go to a church. So um, it, it may be that that's part of the reason. Um, so, that, 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 so it is essentially when you're writing uh, Outgrowing God and, and, and giving these ideas, they really are more specifically for people who fundamentally Belief the Bible or whatever religious scripture it is to be true, but what about those for whom it's it's religious myth, uh, you know, and legend, which is very different from that. And and yes, and please. I agree with that. Um, but but I don't quite understand then why they. I mean, it, myth and legend is fine. I mean, I love myth and legends, and there are myths myths and legends all over the world. But why do they then say, well, I'm a Christian? But in a mythological sense, why don't they just say, well, I'm interested in myths and legends. I'm interested in the myths of the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Chinese and the, and the Sumerians and, and, the, and the Mayans and the Incas. Um, but they will say, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm, but, I, but I believe it's all myth and legend. It's all, it's all metaphor. Um, why, why add I'm a Christian? The reason is they're brought up Christian. So that it's just a kind of loyalty to, um, the heritage of their parents and grandparents. And I think that that's, as it were, belies the suggestion that they're interested in it as myth and legend. I think there's also...